But then there came a time where the uh, Israelites, which were at that time were a divided bunch of uh, tribes, decided to come together under one king, and they called for a king. And the prophet Samuel uh, uh, decided, okay, they want a king, I'll find him a king. And one day, uh, a big Israelite uh, named Saul is looking for his donkey, and he goes to see the prophet Samuel to see if... Uh, the uh, witch doctor that he is, he can uh, locate the donkey for him. But uh, Samuel lays a trip on Saul's and said, oh, well, you know what? The Lord's going to anoint you king over his inheritance, and you're going to be king of the Israelites. And he puts the anointing oil on him, and he says, you will feel the spirit of the Lord come upon you in great power, right? And here we see the whole role of set and setting. You know, we can imagine if we'd never tried any of these substances, and the local witch doctor comes to us and lays it on us and says, oh, well, once you take this, you're going to feel the spirit of the Lord coming on you. As soon as you feel that high, that would all be magnified by the scenario and trip that had been laid on you. And that's like the role of set and setting. In Saul's case, we can see this is particularly powerful because it says Saul begins to prophesy. Now, uh, um, the word uh, prophesy that the, the Hebrew translation is from uh, is nabi. In fact, there's like six different words that are translated as prophet, but they all mean different things. And nabi means to act in an ecstatic or frenzied manner. So Saul's obviously overwhelmed with uh, the experience, starting to freak out a little bit, strips off his clothes, runs off, and they find him hiding in the baggage the next day. So uh, they have to bring him out and force him to be king, you know. So that's kind of a classic example of uh, set and setting and kind of a funny one from the Bible. Now, an interesting thing happens also in the story of Samuel is uh, there may have been a situation where his son broke into the holy cannabis crop and got some and was almost going to be put to death for it. There's a story described by Dr. C. Crichton, who was writing in 1903, wrote an essay, Evidence of the Hashish Vice in the Old Testament. And uh, he says, uh, um, points to the story of, uh, of Jonathan being in a field of what is called honeywood. Um, and he sticks his staff into the honeywood, and he takes it to his mouth, and his eyes become enlightened. Well, there, there's no such thing as a, a honey that exudes from wood. And it, uh, the word itself in Hebrew, yagar hadash, makes more reference to a sticky or resin that comes out of a wood. And Creighton speculated that these references to honeywood, there's a few of them in the Old Testament as well, were also further references to cannabis. And it's interesting to point that when well, that when Jonathan tastes the honey, his eyes become enlightened, and they become enlightened in exactly the same way as Adam and Eve's do after eating of the forbidden fruit of the, of the tree of knowledge. So this, again, points to a psychoactive uh, a, a substance, you know. Um, from, uh, Solomon, uh, from the story of Saul and uh, Jonathan and, and, and the references to Honeywood, uh, we move into the next biblical account, which is in the um, Song of Songs. Now, the Song of Songs is probably the most beautiful piece of literature in the Bible, and uh, I'll read you the verse where uh, cannabis comes into it. Uh, How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your ointment than any spice. Well, basically, they're saying here there's a preference for the ointment over even wine. You know, how much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your ointment over any spice? Uh, the fragrance of your garments is like that of Lebanon. Well, I'm an international a hash judge this year. And let me tell you, there's a scent of Lebanon in that as well. Um, your plants are an orchid of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna, nard, and saffron, cannabis, and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree. Now, um... The Song of Songs is pretty interesting because it describes a marriage scenario and we really have to understand that at that time, in, in this time in the, the Hebrew Kingdom period, uh, uh, Jehovah, or Jehovah as he was known then, or close to that, and Jehovah, uh, um, uh, was worshipped uh, alongside gods and goddesses from the other cultures and uh, indigenous to the area. And Solomon was continually uh, lambasted in the Old Testament for uh, worshipping on high and burning incense in the high places and uh, following the goddesses of the Sidon Sidonians, Asherah, Astarte, and these different uh, uh, embodiments of the goddess. And uh, his incense worship seems to have been tied with that, that somewhat. And this, as I'll point out as we go a little bit further along in this scenario, may have had a lot to do with uh, um, what, what fell out there. We can see a modern reproduction of Moises initiating a priest and uh, the incense burning. Uh, again, here's the pillar of smoke where Moses would have talked to the Lord and uh, the anointing of Saul. Again, this is like a very important part. Every king 
every Judaic king up until about three or 400 BC had to go through this anointing ceremony as well as every priest. So uh, this was obviously a very important thing, you know, uh, um, and it was how the spirit of the Lord was brought into the ruler.